This lecture is going to be on orthopedic emergencies. Going to cover three major topics. Um, these are my disclosures. And these are the object, uh, objectives. So uh, first thing is to understand the assessment, management, and sequela of open fractures. Uh, the other objective is to understand the pathophysiology, etiology, assessment, and management of compartment syndrome. And to understand the assessment and management of joint dislocation. So these are the three topics we'll cover. We already covered some basics of fractures and you've uh, heard a lot about fractures in some of the other lectures so far, so I won't spend too much time on that, just hit the main points, but we'll focus quite a bit on compartment syndrome and to some degree on joint dislocation. So I'll actually start off with uh, compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome is something that happens when there's increased intracompartmental pressure in one of the uh, muscle compartments in, in, uh, in a patient. It can be due to fracture and or severe soft tissue injury. Uh, it can be due to prolonged pressure or prolonged hyper hypoperfusion to the limb, for instance. Someone is very hypotensive who has lost blood, for instance, for whatever reason, for a long period of time, um, or has had a um, loss of arterial of circulation to a particular limb itself um, for whatever reason, arterial injury or um, something like that. And it uh, basically leads to tissue ischemia, which uh, can then lead to uh, tissue death, particularly the muscles in that compartment. So when you diagnose a compartment syndrome, it's a surgical emergency, right? It requires immediate fasciotomy. We'll get into that. So a couple things you should know about that you're going to hear quite a bit when talking about compartment syndrome are the five so-called five P's. Uh, and uh, this really pertains a little bit more to adults. Um, in children, uh, the uh, clinical diagnosis can be a little bit different. Um, but the classic five P's are pain, and I kind of highlight that because that's really what you want to, uh, th this is, you want to diagnose things at this stage, right? But then it can progress to paresthesia, meaning numbness, paralysis, meaning uh, muscles aren't working anymore. So in the lower extremity, you can start with a foot drop. That is the anterior compartment typically goes first. Um, pallor, meaning uh, discoloration and pulselessness. So you really don't want things to get to this stage. I mean, at that point, um, you, or you potentially can just have limb loss. Uh, and you want to get things at the pain stage where pain is uh, uh, getting out of proportion, uh, as we say, to the degree of injury. And I'll explain a little bit of that uh, in some later slides. Keep in mind that you can't measure a lot of these clinical signs in an obtunded or intubated patient or someone who also really can't communicate with you properly. Um, children are a good example. Um, maybe, like I said, an intubated patient who can't communicate and tell you if there's pain. Maybe they can't hear you uh, or understand you if you're asking them to move their fingers or toes um, and you can't assess numbness, for instance. Um, and I also uh, mention uh, patients with a different language, culture, or a patient with a psychiatric problem. Again, these are communication issues. Trying to understand um, clinically what's going on with that patient can be difficult, for instance, um, so like if they're schizophrenic, um, or if they, um, uh, like I said, speak a different language and you don't have an interpreter, or even a patient who maybe um, you know, speak some English, uh, you feel like you're communicating with them, but you don't really, uh, but perhaps they come from a different culture uh, and uh, perhaps they express pain differently. Okay, and there's just a bit of a balance you have to play, and I don't want to get too off topic, but you have to balance a little bit uh, stereotypes with cultural competency. Um, and this is one of those aspects in clinical medicine where uh, you may have to recognize that perhaps, you know, because a patient is um, from a different background, uh, comes from a different culture, they may uh, express 
pain differently than what you're used to. Uh, so potentially you may have a patient who's extremely stoic and that's normal um, where they come from and they could be having a compartment syndrome. Uh, and you know this happens, I've seen it happen. So, um, so I, I spent a lot of time on this because uh, a lot of people will say that compartment syndrome is a clinical diagnosis, right? So you really have to be very well versed in the clinical signs. Now that said, there are also, are also some objective measurements, and namely compartment pressure measurements or intracompartmental pressure measurements. So there's two schools of thought, right? One says that. So first school of thought, greater than 30 millimeters mercury. So if you have a patient uh, and you check pressure measurements and it requires actually sticking a needle in the leg or wherever, uh, and you get a pressure greater than 30, it's a compartment syndrome. Other people say no. Um, there's a second school of thought that says you should have this pressure gradient um, uh, that you're looking at, not just an absolute pressure. So that, for instance, if somebody's diastolic pressure is 80 and their pressure is 35, then they have enough of a pressure head or enough of a, um, of a difference there or so-called delta P uh, that they should still be able to perfuse that, that compartment. And some people put this delta P at 30, some people put it at 20. Uh, but it's basically a you know around that uh, number, and, it, and 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 some people feel that you know you should look at that more so than just the absolute number of 30. So it most commonly occurs in the leg and in the forearm. Uh, it can also occur in the thigh, foot, upper arm, hand, buttock. It can occur in patients that were found down, so to speak. So somebody, for instance, who was overdosed on drugs, um, and uh, is obtunded for a long period of time, uh, a very significant risk for getting compartment syndrome uh, on the uh, parts of their body that they're, they're laying on, motionless, potentially on a hard floor. Um, it is, like I said, a surgical emergency when a diagnosis is made. And if you miss a diagnosis, this can lead to permanent muscle death, contractures, and uh, lawsuits. So some definitions. Um, Compartment syndrome, I, I like this, this definition, it's, it's when you have elevated tissue pressure within a closed fascial space uh, that, reduce, that um, results in reduced tissue perfusion and eventually can result in progressive cell death. And the way this occurs really is too much inflow, so you may have edema, you may have hemorrhage, and again, once you start getting inflammation and potentially impaired perfusion, you have leaky vessels, you have more edema, and you sort of have this, you know, vicious cycle of um, uh, increased uh, um, fluid creating um, uh, increased pressure. And you have decreased uh, outflow uh, as a potential cause as well, a tight dressing, uh, tight cast, uh, venous obstruction. Um, so it's important to know what is a compartment. All right, so a compartment, uh, and this is an example of the lower leg cross section, uh, there are these um, areas in the body where you have muscles and nerves surrounded uh, or enveloped by a fascia and bone without much breathing room. Okay, so uh, in the lower leg here you have the, uh, you have the tibia, you have the fibula, you have the interosseous membrane here, okay, and then you have an anterior compartment, okay, then you have a lateral compartment, and then you have a deep posterior compartment, and then you have the superficial posterior compartment. Okay, and this is just showing how you can perform fasciotomies to go in and open up the compartments and release the fascia to give uh, the tissue some breathing room. So. This essentially begins whenever the pressure in the compartment is higher than the pressure in the capillaries of the compartment, and then blood nutrients can't get to those cells uh, and those tissues. Tissues begin to die. Then, like I said, they can become leaky and lead to more swelling. Now, the normal tissue pressure in a compartment is 0 to 4 millimeters mercury, and it can go up a little bit with exertion, like if you're running or something. Uh, 
and with the absolute pressure theory, um, this is the number you should remember: is that um, at rest the absolute pressure should be about should should not go higher than 30. And once it does, you may have a compartment syndrome. Um, again, the pressure gradient theory says that you should have this delta p, and the delta p uh, should be less than 30 or maybe 20 millimeters of mercury um, from diastolic pressure. So muscle tissue um, without uh, you know, appropriate perfusion can show uh, muscle damage that's reversible but then potentially becomes irreversible after eight hours. So if you have a raging compartment syndrome, uh, it's an emergency, you're on the clock uh, to treat it and um, you have to get that released within uh, eight hours. And the problem is a lot of times we don't know when that clock started, right? So it's very hard to know like how long the muscle has been, um, you know, under those uh, circumstances, and uh, therefore, when you diagnose this, really, uh, the treatment is an immediate fasciotomy. Uh, and same thing with the nerve tissues. So nerve tissues also can um, undergo irreversible changes. So I kind of mentioned fractures, both closed and open fractures. Can you know, even when you have an open fracture, and you think, well, you know, it's isn't that a fasciotomy? Well, no, you can still actually get a compartment syndrome. Um, crush injuries, right? So people who um, have, um, you know, severe blunt trauma, or maybe the prototypical example of like an earthquake victim with, you know, building on top of them or something. Uh, temporary vascular occlusion uh, can cause this as well, as well as arterial injury. Uh, and uh, a tight cast, or many of these other examples given here. Now, I kind of briefly mentioned this before. You really want to look for pain out of proportion, right? Pain out of proportion. So this is tough because everybody's different. Everybody experiences pain different. You're giving pain medications, right? I mean, pain is different for everybody. So somehow you have to determine that this is pain out of proportion. Um, also, you want to get some sense that the compartment feels tense. Well, what is tense? Uh, somebody who has a large fatty soft tissue envelope might not feel that tense as compared to a lean patient who has very little subcutaneous tissue. Um, you want to look for pain with passive stretch of the muscle. So this is a key thing as well. So you really want to look for that. So if you dorsiflex the toes and the ankle, you're stretching the posterior compartments. If you plantar flex, you're stretching the anterior compartment. You want to certainly look for paresthesia. Now, hopefully you're not getting to this point, but if you are, you know, you really want to stop it in its tracks uh, at this point. Numbness uh, is what you want to look for. Paralysis is when you've, you start, are developing potentially, uh, you know, loss of muscle tissue at this point or, um, or nerve uh, tissue. And then uh, loss of pulses, like I said, is a very late finding. You never want to get to this point. So differential diagnosis, um, and now these things are not necessarily mutually exclusive from compartment syndrome, certainly not arterial occlusion. It can lead to a compartment syndrome, but can it also lead to, in the early stages, something similar uh, with that type of uh, pain. A peripheral nerve injury can lead to numbness, it can lead to some paralysis, um, and potentially a patient can have a neuropathic type pain associated with it, but that's not a compartment syndrome. And a muscle rupture. Uh, you can have a muscle rupture that leads to um, paralysis, pain with passive stretch, right? Because you're pulling on that muscle that's ruptured. Uh, and it, again, it's not mutually ex exclusive. You can have bleeding from a muscle rupture that can lead to um, compartment syndrome in the involved compartment. So like I said, treatment is fasciotomy. Um, you want to open the compartment, release the pressure, allow blood flow to the cells, and prevent death of the cells. Here's an example uh, in the lower leg. So I think here are some clinical scenarios um, to uh, think about um, that your patient may fall under. So if the patient's not awake or can't respond to an examination, uh, then you may need to really consider if pressure in the comp uh, or consider measuring the pressure in the compartment to determine if a compartment syndrome exists, right? So 
again, getting back to that point, if you can't really communicate well with the patient and you um, are concerned, you might have to you know, stick that patient in check. Um, so how do you do that? Well, here's uh, a, a potential setup. You can use an arterial line, which has a pressure transducer. Uh, you have to, or you can, you know, use um, a standard needle or a side-ported needle if available. You can also use a handheld pressure monitor. And I won't get too much into the, the techniques of how you measure, but essentially it's an invasive procedure, um, traditionally speaking. What about pain? Well, um, like I said, it's subjective, right? Pain out of proportion is what you want to look for. Um, pain with passive stretch is perhaps a little bit more objective, uh, but overall pain is subjective, right? Everybody experiences it differently. It can be masked by pain medications or altered levels of consciousness, and it will be different based on ethnic and cultural backgrounds. So what about physical exam? Yeah, you know, you want to maybe be more objective. You examine the patient. Pain is subjective, but, you know, when you examine a patient and you're looking for you know, you look for your passive stretch, uh, maybe you're not so sure, you want to say, well, this patient is, let's check how swollen they are. Well, how swollen is too swollen? And these are quotes. When you ask, let's say you're on the phone and you're, you know, I'm getting a phone call and I want to know, uh, well, what do you think? How swollen is the leg? Well, someone might say, oh, it's swollen. Well, someone else might say it's firm but compressible or it's swollen but not tight uh, or it's swollen but it's not compartment syndrome swollen. Um, I mean, that's the problem is, I mean, these are um, very subjective findings. And some studies have actually shown that uh, in a laboratory model of a compartment syndrome, you can get very different answers uh, and many incorrect answers as to whether or not the patient, that uh, specimen, it was a lab study um, thinking about in particular, um, uh, whether there was truly a compartment syndrome. That is, physical exam was not that accurate in trying to be able to check tissue tension and firmness and say, oh, that's a compartment syndrome or that is not. So physical exam is difficult. So I think pressure monitoring is necessary in a few situations. So one is the obtunded or intubated patient with tense or tight compartments in a clinical scenario that's suspicious for compartment syndrome, like a fracture or crush injury, uh, so in a case like that, you probably should get a uh, you should be, you should be checking a compartment pressure measurement, or an obtunded or intubated patient with a tibia fracture and has a so-called swollen leg and is hypotensive. So somebody in the ICU who uh, is a little bit unstable, um, you may be needing to check compression uh, pressure measurements. Or I, this is another one I, th I like to mention. If you find yourself debating with a colleague, so I mean, if one person says, well, I don't know, I don't think it's a compartment syndrome. Someone says, well, maybe it is. And now you find yourself just pontificating on it. Um, you need to put that to rest uh, and uh, just get a pressure measurement. So I think pressure monitoring might be necessary in these situations. Someone who has pain uh, with passive stretch, a swollen leg, and has a tibia fracture, you might need it. Uh, an obtunded patient with a tibia fracture that's swollen but not tense. Well, again, what's swollen but not tense? I mean, you don't know. Um, and uh, you'd have to be pretty confident uh, that uh, it's not that swollen. Um, so you may have to consider getting a pressure measurement. There's some situations where you definitely, well, I don't shouldn't say definitely, would most likely don't need it. Right? So one is patient with no clinical signs or symptoms uh, in an awake patient uh, or a patient who's awake with a tibia fracture, let's just say with minimal pain medication usage and minimal soft tissue swelling, right? So you should be able to go with clinical signs. Or the opposite, tibia fracture or whatever other fracture you're dealing with would clear-cut symptoms of compartment syndrome, right? So all the red flags are going off and you can get pressures to confirm or document or maybe get them in the OR but it's probably not going to change your decision. So somebody who has a raging compartment syndrome and all, everything's checking out, um, you need to consider doing it. All right, so I'm going to pause there. And uh, that was the biggest portion of the lecture. And then we'll pick up uh, with the rest in the uh, next video. Thanks.